So we begin with uh, the Minor Prophets. The uh, title of the course is Minor Prophets uh, for uh, Beginners, subtitled Majoring in Minors. And this is lesson number one in this series, and it is the, uh, the introduction. Uh, let me begin our study of the Minor Prophets by stating two basic facts about the Minor Prophets. First of all, these 12 books are referred to as the Minor Prophets because of the length of their books and not because of the importance or the legitimacy of the prophets who uh, wrote them. A little math here, uh, for example, when examining the major prophets, uh, we see, for example, Isaiah's book, 66 chapters, Jeremiah's book, 52 chapters, uh, Lamentations, five chapters, Ezekiel's book, 48 chapters, Daniel's book, 12 chapters, if you do the math, average of about 46 chapters. So the major prophets, 46 chapters. The average length of the 12 minor prophets books is about six chapters. So uh, uh, the reason why uh, these are named uh, based on the length and not importance uh, a little known fact, uh, apparently the name Minor uh, Prophets, that term was coined by Augustine, the uh, Catholic uh, theologian, the monk, who referred to the longer books as major and shorter books as Minor Prophets. Augustine lived 354 to 430 uh, AD. Uh, in a, a general sense, the Minor Prophets can be divided into three main periods after the time of the United Kingdom. And I want to talk about these because it'll help you to uh, keep in context, you know, when they lived will give you an idea of what was going on. And it'll also help you uh, memorize uh, the, uh, the names of uh, the books. Key date, uh, 721 uh, BC. This, uh, this is the year that the Northern Kingdom of Israel was defeated by the Assyrian army and the Jewish people were carried off and uh, relocated in various parts of the Assyrian empire where they were eventually assimilated into foreign cultures, foreign families, and most importantly for those people, foreign pagan religions and practices, something they uh, were never able to come back from. Now, uh, so that's the key date. Uh, so we're gonna back up a little bit uh, from, from that. We know that from about 1000 BC to 900 BC, and I'm rounding out these, uh, these years here simply to help you remember them. So from about 1000 BC to 900 BC, the Jewish nation uh, was united. It was composed of 12 tribes, descended of course from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, they were eventually united under one king, King Saul, and then of course David succeeded Saul and then Solomon succeeded his father David. Now when Solomon died in 931 BC, after his death, civil war uh, broke out over who would reign the 12 tribes. And so they had a united kingdom, all 12 tribes under one king for about a century. After Solomon dies, there's a power struggle. This power struggle eventually led to a split in the united kingdom uh, and uh, you had the divided kingdom. Uh, this led to a split in the United Kingdom. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, uh, formed the Southern Kingdom. Um, they remained loyal to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who ruled what was then called the Southern Kingdom of Judah and its capital, uh, the city of Jerusalem. The other 10 tribes located in the north also uh, formed what's called, or what was called the Northern Kingdom of Israel. So the Northern Kingdom was called Israel. The Southern Kingdom was called Judah. Uh, 
of the northern kingdom of Israel led by one of Solomon's former officials, Jeroboam, who ruled from its first capital city, Shechem. The northern kingdom also had the city of Tirzah as capital, and finally the city of Samaria remained its capital until the kingdom was eventually defeated in 721 by the Assyrians, something which I mentioned at the opening of my, uh, of my talk. Therefore, from the death of Solomon in 931 BC to the destruction of the southern kingdom in 587 BC, you had a divided kingdom lasting approximately 350 years with each kingdom, north and south, having 20 kings reigning over them. Now, the northern kingdom, because they were mainly absorbed by other cultures and other religions, was never uh, reestablished. I mean, they were uh, referred to as the lost tribes of Israel. So when you hear uh, people saying the lost tribes of Israel, they're not talking about the 12 tribes, they're talking about the 10 northern tribes. They were lost, why? Well, because they were scattered throughout the uh, uh, Assyrian uh, Empire. Now, some of them ref returned to settle back in their ancient tribal territories, but because they had, a, you know, they had mixed with other nations, they had also mixed with pagan religions, they were no longer considered purely Jewish and they were referred to as Samaritans, the original name of the land and capital of the northern tribes, which was Samaria. They uh, continued to be mentioned in the Jewish historical records right up to the time of Jesus. Uh, for example, the woman at the well in John chapter four, verses four to 42, she was, we call the Samaritan woman. She was a Samaritan. She was a descendant of uh, these people from the north. However, they were never again included as part of the Jewish nation, and they were not permitted to participate in temple worship. With time, they were held in contempt by the Jews and the word Samaritan was used as a term of derision by the Jewish people themselves. Um, uh, I quote, it says, the, the Jews answered and said to Jesus, remember this in the John 8, 48, it says, the Jews answered and said to him, Jesus, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And so to be a Samaritan, that was an that was a insulting word. If somebody called you a Samaritan, that was, not, that was not a good thing. Now to the Orthodox Jew of the time, a Samaritan was more unclean than a Gentile of any other nationality. That's how low the esteem was for the Samaritan people. And so the area of the Northern Kingdom was eventually repopulated by mixed race Jews and referred to as Samaria. Now, after its defeat in 587 BC, so the Northern Kingdom defeated 721 BC, the Southern Kingdom defeated 587 BC. So after its defeat in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, many of the Jewish survivors, uh, artisans, craftsmen, young nobles, young women, priests, Levites, temple officials, rabbis, these type of people were carried off into exile uh, into uh, Babylon. Unlike the Assyrians, whose method with conquered peoples was to destroy their unity and to destroy their culture by spreading them into foreign nations, thereby eliminating them as a future threat. That's how the Assyrians handled the people that they conquered. It wasn't enough simply to go in and overrun their cities and loot them and, you know, and so on and so forth. They wanted to crush them. They didn't want to have to come back and fight these people a second time. So they merely you know, 
transported them into different cities so that they would simply be culturally assimilated uh, 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 by uh, uh, different uh, peoples. Now, unlike the Assyrians, as I said, whose method with conquered people was to destroy their unity and so on and so forth, um, and for that reason, the Northern Kingdom of the Jews never became a powerful nation again. Even after they returned to Samaria, they could never recapture the cultural uh, purity and the uh, cultural pride that they had as uh, Jews. The Babylonians, however, they were different. They uh, built up their empire by re-educating and retraining their exiled captives for service to the Babylonian empire, depending on their education or skill or trade. That's why when they carried off uh, people into exile, they just didn't round everybody up. They, they chose the artisans, you know, people with trades and people with skills those who had served at the royal court, who had education, uh, young virgins that could be married off and so on and so forth. So they kind of took the cream of the crop, if you wish, and carried those off into captivity and left uh, the poor, uh, usually farmers and uh, sheep herders and so on and so forth. They left them uh, in uh, the southern kingdom simply to tend to the land so the land wouldn't be overrun by wild animals and overgrown, uh, but presented no, um, no threat to them militarily. Uh, and we see a kind of an example of their method when we read the story of Daniel. You know, Daniel and his uh, three friends are educated and fed and trained and so on and so forth, and eventually put to work on behalf of the, uh, of the empire. Well, the reason, or not the reason, but the fact that the, the Babylonians did this type of thing enabled the Jewish exiles from the southern kingdom of Judah to maintain their culture and their religion even while they were living in exile in a foreign nation. Something that the northern kingdom people were not permitted to do when they were uh, exiled. And so it's during the 70 years of exile in Babylon that the Jews, uh, for example, began to establish synagogues. There were no synagogues in, in Israel or in Judah before uh, they were carried off into exile. If people wanted to worship, they went to the temple that was in uh, Jerusalem. That's where you went uh, to worship. But of course, while they were in captivity, there was no more temple. There was no place to go to offer a sacrifice. And so uh, they established synagogues. In the Hebrew word uh, meant house of assembly or house of prayer. And they did this in order to continue a kind of organized worship since their temple in Jerusalem was uh, destroyed. Remember, uh, they carried off artisans and they carried off officials, but they also carried off priests and they carried off rabbis. And so these people were able to continue their type of ministry to the exiled people who were in uh, Babylon. The New Testament church, for example, is patterned after the Jewish synagogue where the activities were similar. Uh, there was teaching, there was prayer, there was praise, there was fellowship, there was service. Uh, this is what went on uh, at a, a Jewish synagogue. Uh, and uh, later on, when the church was established, this is what went on in a Christian uh, church, right? Uh, people uh, prayed, uh, they had fellowship, they praised God, they served. Uh, one difference, however, the main difference being that in the synagogue, the high point of the service was a reading from the law uh, or the prophets, uh, often concerning the promises of a Messiah and uh, preparation for keeping uh, the various uh, feasts. Very interesting, Lise and I did visit a synagogue. A friend of ours was a Jewish and he said, hey, come synagogue service, you'll be my guest. Sure, we went and uh, we were there. <laughs> I mean, it looked like a Church of Christ, you know what I mean? Seriously, it looked exactly like this place. It had benches like this, had a stage. Uh, uh, and the only difference was uh, we have a, a table here, you know, where we put the elements. 
uh, usually carved, do this in remembrance of me for the communion. And in the synagogue, they had something on, the, on a table in the front. It was like a, uh, it was like a, um, a safe, a, a cabinet, if you wish. And uh, uh, when you opened the cabinet, inside was a scroll. And the scroll was the law, it was, it was the Hebrew Bible. And the high point of the Jewish service that she and I witnessed was the rabbi went and got the, the scroll and with much ceremony, you know, they carried it to the table and they laid it on the table and they rolled it out. And I remember that night, uh, uh, there was a special guest uh, preacher or rabbi and they said, well, Rabbi Stein tonight, our guest, is going to be reading from Isaiah or Jeremiah and they would have the reading. And after the reading, they would roll up the scroll uh, and they would take it and hold it up like this and they would uh, uh, go around the, uh, the auditorium, uh, just like we have here, and, and, and people would reach out from the pews to touch, to touch it or kiss it, you know, their uh, uh, loyalty, uh, their allegiance to the law of God, the word of God. That, that was the high point of their service. Uh, everything else was the same. I was so uh, surprised uh, when the, the service began and I said, you know, somebody came forward and said, we'll begin our, uh, our service. Uh, what do you think they began their service with? Announcements. <laughs> they had announcements, you know, so they did a bunch of announcements and then they said our first song will be, and somebody led a song, then somebody led a, an opening. It was exactly what it was exactly what we do in, in a New Testament church. Again, the difference being that the high point for us was, is of course uh, taking the communion. So uh, in the New Testament church, the high point is the commemoration of the coming of the Messiah and his atonement on the cross, followed by his resurrection three days later. Interesting, in other words, they worshiped in hope of a coming savior and still do so today, many of the Jewish sects. And we worship in thanksgiving for the Savior who has already come and we are waiting for his return. So there's a, there's a similarity, but a very great difference even in that similarity. So make no mistake, uh, however, uh, the events in the news today and uh, their ancient customs and the seeming wisdom of their great religious teachers, uh, the bravery of their military and the sureness in their, uh, or their success in the world of art and science and finance, all of these accomplishments. However, the Jewish nation and the Jewish religion continues to categorically and strongly deny that Jesus is uh, the Messiah or that Jesus is the Son of God. And they consciously strive to reject this idea. Uh, they are not sympathetic to Christianity and uh, they do undermine its promotion when, it, when it's possible. So even though there are many similarities, there's one great difference and the great difference is uh, they continue in this generation to reject that Jesus uh, is the Messiah. They rejected Jesus as Lord 2000 years ago and they continue to do so today as a group. Although in every generation there are some, some Jewish cultural Jews who do accept Christ. Uh, the Lord gathers some in every uh, generation. Of course, we have no prejudice against any nation, including our Jewish neighbors, desiring that every nation hears and believes the gospel. We want everybody to believe the gospel, whether you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever, the gospel is for everyone and we preach it to everyone. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, let's see what else we've got about that. Uh, and of course, you know, in accepting uh, Jesus, uh, all are baptized in his name and become as we are, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so back to my main point here, wandered off a little bit. Main point, the Southern Kingdom uh, was able to maintain its cultural purity and its religious practice even while they were in exile and thus 
when Jeremiah's prophecy of their eventual return after 70 years in Jeremiah 25, 12, just briefly where Jeremiah re, you know, mentions the 70 years, he says, then it'll be when the 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation declares the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and I will make it an everlasting desolation. And of course, he's talking about the Babylonians who are eventually overtaken by the Medo uh, Persian uh, Empire, exactly as Jeremiah uh, predicted in his uh, prophecy. So uh, the point here, what is the point, Michael? Well, the point is this. When the time for their return came, they were not only ready, but actually able to reestablish a uniquely Jewish kingdom, much like the one that they had before they were destroyed and sent into exile. The Northern Kingdom, even though many came back to populate the Northern Kingdom area, never was able to reestablish uh, any type of kingdom. The Southern Kingdom, however, because they maintained their religious uh, purity and they maintained their cultural integrity, when the time came for them to come back, they were actually able to reestablish uh, their uh, their kingdom. And the account of this return and reestablished is recorded in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So let us therefore go back uh, to our timeline and this time assign the prophets who were sent by God to speak to the northern and the southern kingdoms, mainly warning them of the calamities that were coming upon them because of their disobedient conduct. The point here is that the minor prophets worked largely uh, in warning and, 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 and exhorting the northern and the southern kingdoms about their impending uh, destruction. Assigning the minor prophets according to this timeline helps us to remember them and their messages more easily than simply kind of memorizing the order that they appear in in the Old Testament. Now, before doing this, however, I'd, I'd like to review and compare uh, the Hebrew Bible uh, to the uh, Christian Bible, just uh, because we're going to be dealing with the various books here. Uh, I thought this would be a good point to, uh, to make and to answer some questions that often come up. And so uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible is the, is the name of what we call the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament. A Jewish person would call it the Hebrew Bible. We're both talking about the same thing. So if ever you're talking to a Jewish person, for example, out of politeness, you would refer to the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you wouldn't be you know, copping out or anything like that. If you said that, you would simply be, uh, you're simply being polite and referring to the text by the term that they refer to the text. The Hebrew Bible, the big difference, uh, it's all the same books, they simply divide them uh, differently. For example, you have the Torah or the book of instruction that includes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then the Nevi'im or the prophets, and for them, they divide them former, latter, and minor. So the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, and the minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible are all grouped into one book. We have 12 books, right? They have one book called the minor prophets and they have 12 chapters. Uh, that's how it works. And so the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then they have the Ketuvim or the writings, the poetic writings, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. They have the scrolls, the Megio, the five Megio, the scroll, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and uh, Esther. And then they have the historical books, what they call the historical books, uh, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicle for a total of 24 books. So they divide the, what we call the Old Testament into 24 uh, books. 
very handy information uh, to have. Well, you can't compare the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible without actually at least looking at the Old Testament uh, for Christians, how we divide the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, uh, the same first five books. Then we have the historical, what we call the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are considered the historical books. Then we have the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Then we have the prophetic books, major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel. Of course, Lamentations is the book written by Jeremiah, those two go together. And then we have the minor prophets, as we mentioned, the same 12 minor prophets uh, for a total of 39 books. Now, I want to talk about uh, some other books that we often see, but we don't really talk about a lot. And in our introduction, I'd like to mention these and comment a little bit about these. These are the deuterocanonical books, the deuterocanonical books. These books are considered canonical, meaning inspired by uh, Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox churches, the Oriental Orthodox church, the Assyrian Orthodox church, but they are not considered inspired uh, by, the, by Jews, the Jewish people, uh, Protestants or restoration churches or churches of uh, Christ. When we talk about uh, canonical, meaning the canon, the canon um, uh, is a term uh, uh, which means uh, a measure, a measure. So basically, which books measure, measure up to inspiration? When uh, in the early centuries, uh, the church realized that they needed to compile the writing of the apostles because uh, at the beginning, of course, uh, they thought Jesus was coming in their lifetime. The early church, you know, first century church, they thought Jesus was coming in their uh, lifetime. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people started to die off and uh, they were getting close to the end of the first century and still no Jesus. They realized, hmm, we may have to pass on the information that we've received you know, in a written form to the next generation. So there was uh, uh, efforts being made. I mean, this is a whole course in itself, but there were efforts being made to begin to group together, you know, the books uh, that were inspired and separate those from the books that were not inspired because there were a lot of material being written about Jesus, about Christianity, so on and so forth. Uh, the basic rules that would determine which books, which books are in the canon, which books measure up, which books are inspired, uh, against which are not, three basic, there were three basic you know, criteria. The first was, has the book been written by an apostle? Has the book been written by an apostle or uh, the, uh, the disciple of uh, an apostle? Um, uh, secondly, uh, um, uh, has the book uh, received wide circulation in the church? Is it some obscure book that nobody's ever heard about? Or is it a book that has been used by the church for decades, you know, and has been accepted by the church already? It, it, it's not that they, they didn't know which books were inspired, it's that they were going to pick the ones that the church already considered inspired and they were going to group them together in a single you know, volume. That, that's what was happening. The, 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 the letters, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the epistles, uh, the gospels, they were floating around uh, separately, individually. Sometimes one or two were put together, you know, and so the effort was made to put all of the inspired books into one uh, into a one volume. That had already been done by the Jews. The Old Testament canon had been organized and uh, recognized 150 years before Jesus. So the Jews, you know, they had already, you know, the Jewish canon uh, 
was already established. You know, when we talked about, uh, you know, the, uh, the Old Testament, the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, that Hebrew Bible was the way it was, you know, a century before Christ. It was the New Testament that had to be, uh, that had to be organized. All right, so uh, the, there were many books that had a lot of information, but did not quite measure up to being included in the canon. And these are what we call the deuterocanonical books. And what's interesting is uh, certain books in the deuterocanonical group were accepted as inspired by certain churches or certain groups within Christianity. So these books, the, uh, the number one, deuterocanonical one, uh, Tobit, Judith, Additions to Esther, First and Second Maccabees, The Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, Additions to Daniel. These books, this material was accepted by the Roman Catholic group, the Eastern Orthodox group, the Oriental Orthodox. When I say Oriental, that refers to geography and not uh, culture. Oriental Orthodox included uh, the Coptic uh, churches, the Armenian churches, uh, uh, and the Syrian uh, 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 churches. Uh, let's see, and as I said, they were not considered as uh, part of the canon uh, by the Jews, nor were they considered part of the canon by all the Protestant groups, uh, and also not by the Restoration Movement churches, churches of uh, Christ. Then we have another group, the Deuterocanonical II, <laughs> another group of books considered canonical uh, or inspired uh, by only Orthodox churches. And those books are 1st and 2nd Esdras, the Prayer of Manasseh, Psalm 151, 3rd and 4th Maccabees, and the Odes. These books were considered inspired only by uh, Orthodox, uh, Orthodox churches. These additional books are included even today in most Catholic or Orthodox Bibles. Uh, and uh, there's some good here. Uh, these books provide information about the period of 400 years between the Old and the New Testament and are often referred to as books of the Apocrypha or the hidden books. Um, and so they were handy because it gave you a, a, an idea of what took place because there was no inspired material uh, in, in that intertestamental time there between the Old and the uh, New uh, Testament. Uh, some people say, well, why were they not included? Well, there was no apostolic authorship for any of these books. Uh, there were errors in the book. There were doctrinal errors in the book or there were uh, historical errors in the books. And many of them were shallow, uh, containing magic rather than miracles, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, I remember one story um, uh, in one of these books that said that, uh, uh, that told the story that Jesus and his father Joseph uh, were working together. You know, he was a carpenter and they were making a table and uh, they needed a, a, a plank of wood to be you know, so wide in order to make the tabletop. And all they had left was a short piece of wood. And so Jesus took the wood and he stretched it out miraculously so that it would fit and they could make the table. Well, you know, it's not quite the, the fish and the loaves feeding the 5,000, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so there are a lot of this type of uh, this type of uh, story. Uh, and of course, they lacked uh, apostolic authorship or authority. You know, we say, well, Luke wasn't uh, an apostle. No, he wasn't an apostle, but he was a disciple of, of Paul, right? And Mark, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Mark, he, he wasn't an apostle, but he was a disciple of Paul. And then later on, he was a disciple of uh, Peter. Uh, he was Peter's uh, uh, secretary. In any event, uh, Jude uh, tells us that we have the true body of faith given to the saints once for all, you know, Jude 3. And Peter in 2 Peter 1 verses 1 to 4 
assures us that God has given us in his word everything we need for spiritual life. There, there, is no, there is no more. All right, well, enough about the official canon of the Bible. We know that the minor prophets were accepted in the Hebrew Bible in 150 uh, uh, BC. Now, an easy way to remember the 12 minor prophets, we'll get back to that as we wrap up here, uh, is to know when they lived and their ministry uh, and to know uh, what period they uh, belong to. Three main periods and places. First, first is the fall of the Northern Kingdom, 721 BC. Before the fall of the Northern Kingdom, God sent prophets to warn them and encourage them to repent. Those prophets include Hosea, Joel. Now there's uncertain date. If you look at different uh, commentaries, uh, different authors give different dates. Uh, and the way that I resolve that uh, for myself and for the class is that I simply uh, follow the order of the minor prophets given in the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament. My thinking is the ones that put together you know, the canon of the Old Testament 150 years before Christ probably knew better which prophets fit where than some uh, scholar 2200 years later. And so I simply follow the order. The order that, they're, that they appear in, in, the, in the Bible is the order that I uh, give them to you uh, to study. Uh, so we have Hosea, we have Joel, we have Amos, uh, the prophet who was from the south, but he preached to the north. Uh, Obadiah, uh, Jonah, who didn't actually preach to uh, uh, who didn't actually preach to the northern kingdom, he preached to Assyria. Uh, and then Micah, who also was from the south, but preached to uh, the north. So uh, the first group of prophets were preaching primarily to the northern kingdom before it fell in 721. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, they belong there. Next, the fall of the southern kingdom, 587 BC. In the same way, before the fall of the Southern Kingdom, God sent prophets to warn them about what was to take place. Uh, and in addition to the example of the uh, Northern Kingdom's fall. In other words, these prophets, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah were able to point to the destruction of the Northern Kingdom because of unfaithfulness and idolatry in their preaching to the Southern Kingdom. And their, you know, their sermon or their message was, don't you, don't you remember what happened to the Northern Kingdom and why they fell? This is going to happen to you. So you know, you'll recognize that message in uh, their uh, preaching. And then, the third uh, section, um, date to remember, is 538 to 457 BC, and that's the return of the exiles. In other words, the southern kingdom was off into Babylon, and then 70 years later, they returned. Uh, the, um, the mistake that we often make about this here is we think all of a sudden, it's, it's the time for the, the Jews to return. And, and they pick everybody and everybody returns all at once and they start, but it didn't work that way. It was waves. There were three waves of, of exiles that returned and we're going to study those three uh, waves of exiles and the prophets that were um, involved and who worked during this time, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Okay, so we've looked at these minor prophets in two main ways in our brief introduction today. Where their books are located in both the Hebrew and Old Testament canons, and when these men served in the history of the Jewish people, you know, 721, 587, you know, 538. So we know when they uh, appear. In our next 
lesson, we're going to begin our review and summary of these books. So in this course, we'll not be doing a line by line study of each minor prophet. You know, we've got 10 lessons here. There's no way that we do 12 books line by line in 10 lessons, unless we were here at nine o'clock in the morning and left at three in the afternoon. That'd be a little bit, uh, a little bit long. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll give you a summary of the content of each book, the history of each book, the main features, as well as information about the author and the purpose and message of each book and some modern day applications. Each book will have those headings. Hopefully by the end of the course, if someone mentions the name of one of these prophets, you will know when he lived, who he preached to, his main message and particular features about his book. For example, somebody mentions Hosea and one of the things that will come to mind is, oh, isn't he the prophet that God told him to marry a prostitute? Actually said, find a prostitute and marry a prostitute? Yes. And, and uh, I'll explain why God did this and uh, how this was um, uh, one of the features of that type of prophecy. Not, not marrying a prostitute, but marrying a prostitute uh, uh, enabled him to act out certain prophecies. And we'll talk about that. Or if I mention Micah, well, you'll, you'll remember that, oh, Micah, he's the prophet that talked about the birthplace of Jesus. Or if we talk about Zechariah, Zechariah, isn't he the one that had the vision of the flying scroll? Uh, so you'll be able to kind of uh, know who these men were and what they were talking about. In the end, you'll not be experts, but you will be familiar with each book and where it fits in the whole. Plus, you have a reason to begin reading the minor prophets, okay? So the, the plan is, uh, I think I have another, thing. there we go. The plan is this, you will read the books before class, like you have an assignment. Read the book of Hosea and read the book of Joel. Not very long, but read those books. Then you'll come to class and we'll review and we'll analyze these books in class. And then you will reread these books after class in order to complete the process. So you read them, we explain them in class, you read them again and you'll see, ah, oh, that makes a whole lot more sense now. Now that I'm reading with this information that I had in class, now I know what they're talking about. I know what, what is going on here, okay? So it's like a prescription, you know? We, <laughs> here's, here's the prescription. Read these two books. Next week, we're going to go over Hosea and Joel, and the assignment will be to reread Hosea and Joel. And by the time you've reread them, you'll see how much more you've understood uh, these first two minor prophets.